Welcome everybody to Amazing Animal Adaptations. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. If you have any questions or comments, please use the question and comment sections on Zoom and through YouTube. And if you are joining us through Zoom, your camera and your microphone are muted. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Welcome everybody to Amazing Animal Adaptations. We'll be getting started in about one minute. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat features and we'll try to answer things as we can. All right, everybody, we're going to get started now. Welcome again to Amazing Animal Adaptations, uh, brought to you from the Maine Wildlife Park. We're going to get started now. If you do have any questions, please feel free to use the chat boxes as we're going. Uh, we're going to go down now live to Jade at Maine Wildlife Park. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Jade, and I'm an educator for the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And today we are at the Maine Wildlife Park in Gray, which is part of the department. And here at the park, we have many different types of native Maine wildlife. We have black bears, moose, different raptors, um, snakes and turtles, bobcats, lynx, beavers, and a lot more. 
And all the animals that are here are here because they were either orphaned or injured. Um, in some cases, they were even illegal pets that are human dependent, um, but all of them can no longer live in the wild on their own. So they live here at the park. And if you wanna learn more about the park itself, you can visit us at mainwildlifepark.com. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on adaptations. And these are different characteristics that animals have to help them survive in different habitats, climates, and we'll even look at how they eat or avoid being eaten. So like I said, an adaptation helps an animal survive. These adaptations can be physical. A physical adaptation would be like our thumbs and fingers that help us grab and hold and open things. So raccoons and possums are animals in Maine that have similar use of their hands and fingers. Then a behavioral adaptation would be like us hiding the last piece of pizza, pizza or storing our snacks away so others couldn't get to them. And this is what squirrels do when they gather their nuts and then they hide them for them to eat later. So here's a picture of a snapping turtle and we can see both the physical and behavioral adaptations at work. So their bodies blend in with the mucky bottom of the pond and then they have this bright pink tongue and that tongue is like a lure, like a fishing lure. So it attracts the fish close to them and then they use their long neck to snap and eat those fish. So they have physical adaptations on their body, but also behaviors that help them survive. As we go through this lesson today, we're also going to give clues to a mystery adapter. So pay close attention and keep track of the clues. And then at the end, we'll see if you can figure it out. So the first type of adaptation we're gonna look at are furs. And an animal's fur can tell us what habitat it lives in and whether that habitat or uh, whether their fur is for a um, wet, hot, dry, or cold climate. And furs are also for camouflage. And they change colors with different um, habitats and for the different seasons. And here is a beaver. So they have special adaptations for living in the water. So their fur is adapted to keeping them warm and dry in the water. Here is a beaver pelt, a beaver fur, and we can see that it has this very glossy, shiny top part of its fur, and that's going to be the part that they um, oil and it keeps them waterproof. And then underneath, they have thicker, fluffier down fur and that keeps them warm in that under layer, that kind of down fluffy fur underneath. So very well adapted for living in cold water. We'll also look at a beaver skull. And beavers have these very special teeth that are adapted for eating um, and stripping wood. So these teeth are orange because they are enriched with iron. And that iron makes them very, very strong. So beavers, obviously they create their own homes and they change their habitats and everything by building their dams and lodges. And they use those super strong iron enriched teeth to do that. I also have a beaver chew. So this is an example of what those teeth can do. If I get close, you can see they have stripped the bark off of it and they'll eat the bark and they'll eat the twigs and the leaves and everything, but they use the dense hard wood part of it to build with. So this end shows those teeth marks. They use those super strong iron and rich teeth to chew into the wood and take down trees. And then at the opposite end, we've created what it would look like for a, a hatchet or an ax to chop the wood. So you can compare the two ends and see the difference between what the beaver's teeth would look like and then what the human activity looks like. Another fur that we'll look at is the lynx and their fur is built for very cold, deep snow. So you can see here this lynx is out in the snow and here I have a lynx fur 
and it's very thick and fluffy. It's gonna help keep them warm. And they also have extra fur on the bottoms of their feet for walking in the snow. And they have very large feet that act like snowshoes. So they are well adapted for living in um, the thicker snow in Northern Maine. Another feline that's here in Maine is the bobcat. And their fur is a little bit different. They have a lot of uh, markings. So they have spots and stripes and it helps them blend in to the light and shadows in the wild so they can stalk and creep up on their prey. So you can see in this picture that this bobcat is really well blended in. And this is a bobcat fur, very different from the lynx fur, has a lot of spots and markings on it for camouflage. Also a little bit smaller though, bobcats are usually smaller than the lynx are. And here's a picture to compare the two. So it's really hard um, if you're out driving or um, just out enjoying nature to tell the two apart. Um, and here are some of those defining characteristics between the lynx and the bobcat um, to help tell those two apart. Their ear tufts, um, their different fur markings, and the size of their feet can help tell those two cats apart. Another animal with special fur is the coyote. So they also have fur that helps them blend into their habitat. The um, more gray colored coyote that's there in the pine needles, that is the coyote here at the wildlife park. And you can see her fur blends in really well with the trees and the ground um, there in the woods. And they also have really thick fur. So I have a coyote fur here. And similar to that lynx, this would be that winter coat. It's very, very thick and fluffy. And they have very long legs for chasing down their prey. And they're gonna shed a lot of this um, weight, a lot of that fur off um, in the warmer seasons, but it's super important for keeping them warm during the colder seasons here in Maine. The next animal is this little weasel. This is the ermine. They are a short-tailed weasel. And this is a picture of the weasel during the um, summer months. So they have special fur that actually changes color based on the seasons. This is what that same species would look like in the winter. So their coat changes color a lot for their different um, seasons to help camouflage and blend in with their habitat. Another um, interesting different coloration that we'll see is called counter shading. And you can see this in squirrels. So they have the darker color fur on top and then the lighter bellies. And that helps them blend into their um, habitat and offers another type of protection when they're climbing through the trees and trying to blend in. So that's called counter shading. Fur can also stand out. So instead of helping you blend in and camouflage, it can be a warning sign for protection, like on the striped skunk. So skunks are nocturnal. That means they're mostly active at night. So these white stripes on the skunk are gonna stand out at night when it's dark. And this is a warning color to get the attention of their um, predators. It says, leave me alone, I will spray you. Very important. We have our first clue now for our mystery adapter and it is about their fur. So their fur is mostly a grayish brown and it helps them blend in in the forest. And I have a sample of this animal's fur here. So you can see this is um, from this animal here at the park and they are shedding right now. So they are losing a lot of that winter coat and this is some of the fur from our mystery adapter. Of course, not all animals have fur. So what could cover an animal's body instead of fur? There are different feathers, scales, and skins that can also cover an animal. 
And just like fur, these all have their own different adaptations for cooling, warmth, camouflage, and more. The first that we'll look at are feathers. And feathers help birds survive similarly to fur on mammals. And there are a lot of different types of feathers. So there are some feathers that help insulate, kind of like that base coat that I showed you on the beaver. This is gonna be that base coat for a uh, bird. And this is the down feather. And this is gonna help keep them warm and dry. And this insulation is so good that people have taken this down and put it into our blankets and jackets to help keep us warm also. Then there are also flight feathers that look very different from down feathers. So here's a flight feather from an owl. And this helps with survival by helping them hunt, helps them build their nests off the ground and keep their um, eggs and babies safe, and also fly away from predators. So very different than fur, but again, helps them have different adaptations for survival. Different animals like turtles, fish, frogs, and snakes are cold-blooded. So instead of needing fur or feathers to keep themselves warm, they have to use their environment to adjust their temperature. So they use the sun to warm themselves and they have scales and shells to protect themselves from other dangers in their environment. So here I have a turtle shell. This is a snapping turtle shell. And this top shell is um, covered in scales. And that is going to be armor, so it's going to help protect the turtle. It's also going to be camouflage. So like we saw in that first picture of the snapping turtle, this is going to help them blend into the, the mucky bottom of the ponds and lakes that they're living in. And then when we look on the inside of the shell, we can see that there's the bone inside of here. So that bone is actually fused into the turtle shell, and their bodies are attached to their shells. So they cannot uh, just duck out of their shells and run away. They carry these with them all the time. Their bones grow into them. We also have an example of a box turtle. And of course that shell is there for protection and some animals like box turtles have, ad have adapted even beyond um, just being able to kind of pull inside a little bit. They actually have a hinge on the bottom of their shell that helps them close up even further. It's one of the ways they got their name, the box turtle, because they can seal up inside their shells like they're in a box. And the Eastern box turtle is actually endangered in Maine. Um, they've lost a lot of their habitat from people building their homes and towns, um, and people take them as pets, which is illegal. You never want to take any turtles from the wild. Um, so if you ever see a box turtle, you want to report that to the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife so we can help um, track their populations and help these turtles hopefully make a comeback. Another reptile is a snake. And here I have a snake skin and their scales cover their whole bodies. They even cover their eyes. So if I get this close here, you can see these clear circles at the top, this is the head. So those bigger clear circles are the scales that would cover their eyes. And then these are the underbelly scales. And then this is the top of their body. And again, this skin is gonna um, shed a few times a year. Um, it's made out of the same types of material like our um, fingernails and hair. So it falls off and it grows back new. Fish have scales and mucus to help protect themselves. This is a rainbow trout here, and we can see those um, fish scales. It's another form of protection. There are also different um, frogs and toads, and they're also covered in a layer of mucus, and this helps keep them from drying out. And then on the toad, they're covered uh, in little bumps. So they also have special skin adapted for their different climate and habitat. And we also have the gray tree frogs here in Maine. And they are really, really great camouflage um, examples. So if you are walking through the woods, 
I would walk right by this frog and have no idea it was there. Their camouflage is amazing. Another clue for our mystery adapter, our second clue is about their teeth. So they also have orange iron enriched teeth for chewing on trees. Like we talked about the beaver before. So similar teeth with the mystery adapter. Next, we're gonna talk about two iconic main animals. So first up is our moose. I have a very big prop here. And this is a moose antler. It is different from a horn in a few different ways. So antlers grow and fall off um, at different times of the year. So a horn will stay on an animal's body for their life, but the antlers will grow and then they will shed them. And you might wonder why they would use so much energy and their resources and everything to grow something so big than to just lose it or shed it off. So the moose that grow these horns are the boys and they are called bull moose. Here is a picture of a bull moose in the winter. And those antlers, they grow them for their mating season. So they use their big antlers to attract females and fight off other males. But then when the mating season's over, they don't need those antlers anymore. So they shed them so they can conserve their energy and eat their food and not have to worry about um, carrying around those big antlers when it's not mating season. And they also have different coats. So here is their fluffy winter coat. It's gonna be very dense and thick. And they have unique hairs that are very hollow. So the center of their hairs can actually trap air and it helps keep um, little warm pockets close to their body. And then in the summer, they're gonna shed out a lot of that hair. So here we can see there's a female moose with her baby, with her calf. And this is gonna be later in the year. So their coats are thinning out, they're shedding a lot. Um, so they don't have to carry those thick winter coats with them in the summer and the spring. Here I can give you a closer look at some moose hair. So it's very thick and it's kind of wiry. And that's going to protect their skin. They spend a lot of time in the forest and then can be found in open spaces also. So this dark brown, very dense, wiry hair for protection and warmth. The next animal that's very iconic to Maine that we'll talk about is the black bear. And they also have fur that is very thick and dense. I have here a black bear fur and it's that dark, thick coat. They're known as the ghosts of the forest because this thick fur and dark color makes them like a shadow moving through the, through the forest. And their thick fur also protects them from bee stings. One of their favorite foods is to get into a beehive and they eat the baby bees, the larvae, for protein. And they'll eat that sweet honey too. It's an extra special treat, but this fur is gonna help them not get stung by those bees. And here we can see this baby bear, this bear cub climbing a tree. So they also have claws and big paws for digging and climbing and for finding their food. So they are very, very good climbers. And speaking of their food, I already mentioned how they eat those bees. But another spot that we'll find uh, if you wanna see a black bear in the wild, these ghosts of the forest is maybe in some blueberry fields. So they also use those claws and paws to rake through the blueberry fields. And they are omnivores. So I said they eat those bees and they're also gonna eat plants. So that makes them an omnivore. They eat both plants and animals. So when we look at this skull, we can see they kind of have a combination of teeth similar to a, a human's teeth for eating both plants and animals. So these canines are sharp and long, but then towards the back of their mouth, their incisors and their molars are flatter and less sharp for grinding up plants. So they have a combination of different teeth for their very diverse diet. Their black bears eat a lot of different foods. 
Our third and final mystery adapter clue is that this animal, like a baby black bear, is also very good at climbing trees. However, they're most known for their modified fur follicles. And these modified fur follicles will stick to any critter that gets too close. So we're gonna review all of our mystery adapter clues and I want you to try and think of what it might be. So we said their fur is this mostly gray brown and helps them blend in with the forest. They have adapted special teeth that are orange. They are iron enriched for chewing on trees. And they're adapted to climbing trees, but they're most known for their special modified fur follicle that will stick to any critter that gets too close. So what do you think the mystery adapter is? It is a porcupine. So porcupines have this thick grayish brown fur and of course those modified fur follicles that we were talking about are their quills. So the picture of the porcupine on the ground is the male porcupine that's here at the wildlife park. We have two here at the park right now. And the other one was done by a photographer it shows that really thick fur they have in the winter and their great tree climbing abilities. And I have, again, I'll show you, this is that kind of up close of the porcupine fur. So this is gonna be the fur that covers their body, but it's not their quills. I also have some quills here. So these are the porcupine quills, and this is that modified fur follicle. So both these types of fur are on their bodies, but they're very different from each other and they serve very different purposes. So this fur is gonna be for um, keeping warm in the winter um, and they'll shed it out later in the year to cool off a little bit. And then these are for protection. So very different fur for very different things. And porcupines can't shoot these off their body. Um, they actually have to make contact with a porcupine to get um, stuck with these quills. So some very interesting um, adaptations for the mystery adapter there. And behind us has been the lynx. I think that they are have been a little bit sleepy today. It's hotter here today um, than it has been here in Maine this spring. <laughs> so they might be taking a little cat nap. Um, but I can answer some questions if any questions have come in. And then maybe by the time I've answered some questions, um, I can spot them and try and get us a little closer to our lynx. Yeah, we only had uh, one question right now. So if you do have questions, now's the time to type them in. Um, but someone had a question of what is a porcupine's favorite food in the wild? Yeah, so um, similar to their habitat. So they're going to be found in um, very dense forests that have hemlock and other um, hardwoods. So one of their favorite foods are hemlock. Here at the park, we have to give them a lot of browse. So we bring them um, different hemlock and um, other types of trees that they strip the bark off just like the porcupine would and they eat the twigs and leaves off of those too. Um, and unlike in the wild here at the park, we also give them a nice salad every day. So they get a lot of extra veggies and things like that too to help supplement some of those um, other vitamins and nutrients that they would be getting in the wild. All right, that's great, thank you. And then another question is, in what part of Maine are the lynx commonly found? That's a good question. So the lynx are not usually found in Southern or even as much in Central Maine. Um, they are in less populated, more rural areas that get more snow and stay cooler throughout the year. So they're gonna be found in Northern Maine. They are called the Canada lynx. So. Um, the closer you kind of get up in northern Maine, um, in some areas of western Maine as well, you might see lynx, but they're pretty hard to find. Um, they don't live in as like human populated areas as the bobcats do. So bobcats will be found um, throughout Maine in a lot of different areas, but the lynx will just be in northern and western Maine. 
And another question is about porcupines. Do they hibernate in the winter? So porcupines, they do not hibernate. Um, they will be a little bit less active, um, but they are still going out and they're searching for food um, all winter long. They have some adaptations that help them stay warm um, in the snow and everything. And they do climb up in the trees and they sleep in the trees. So if you wanna try and find a porcupine, sometimes instead of looking down on the ground, um, you can look up in the, in the branches, especially if you're in one of those hemlock um, dense forests, but they do not hibernate. They stay active during the winter. And a follow-up to that, are porcupines nocturnal? So porcupines are often more active at night. Um, I have seen them um, awake and moving around during the daytime. But again, that's when a lot of their predators might be out and things like that. So they're going to be a little bit safer moving around at night. Um, but they aren't strictly nocturnal. They will also be active during the day. And someone would like to know, do you know how many quills a porcupine has approximately? Yeah, so porcupines um, on average have over 20,000 quills on their body. So they have at least 20,000 of those quills and when they lose quills, they will grow back. Um, so just like their other um, fur on their body, when they lose it, they'll grow more back. So they can just keep replenishing their quills their whole life and they'll have over 20,000 of them. This is great. We have a few more questions um, and then we'll probably be done. Uh, where do owls sleep in Maine? And is it only during the day that they sleep? So it can be different. Um, Maine has like over, four or five different uh, native owl species, um, and then others that come and go through Maine too. So they're gonna sleep in different um, places, but again, they're gonna be in the trees. So they are gonna rest up in the trees. Um, you'll very rarely see the owls in Maine down on the ground. Um, there are different species of owls in different areas of the country that you might see on the ground more. But the owls that live here in Maine are gonna be living in the trees and sleeping up in the trees. That's where they have the best um, point of view up in those trees. All right, and another porcupine question. Do the quills have venom in them? That's a great question. So porcupine quills do not have venom in them. Um, there's no toxins, there's no poison, there's no venom. Um, it's just that they do um, stick into you and they, almost kind of like a scaly texture on that uh, quill. So when it goes into um, its predator, it actually acts like a barb and will kind of hook into them. Um, so it doesn't have any venom or poison, but it will be very painful and they can be tricky to then get back out. Thank you. And another question is about turtles. So since we're starting to see turtles um, this time of year, where do turtles lay their eggs? It's a really good question. So turtles, um, even the ones that live in the water or are more aquatic, have to come onto land to lay their eggs. So they do um, dig, the females dig little nests. So they have to do that in somewhere that has looser soil or sand. Um, but they will uh, find a sandy or dirt spot and they will dig, dig their nests there on the land. Um, and this is the time of year that we, in the springtime, we'll see a lot more turtles being active, looking um, for their nest and coming, go, coming and going from that nesting site that they find. So we definitely wanna be very aware of them, especially by roadways, because sometimes the edges of the road um, are sandy and covered in dirt. So a female will think this is the perfect spot to lay my eggs. Um, so we need to be careful and look out for them on our beaches and lawns and by our roads so we don't hurt those turtles. Uh, and someone would like to know, um, since porcupines and beavers have iron enriched teeth, how are they getting that iron to enrich their teeth? Yeah, so iron does not just come from meat. So porcupines and beavers are just herbivores. So that means they only eat plants and they get the um, iron from leafy greens. So like we can get iron from greens like spinach, they're gonna get iron from the plants that they're eating also. 
So animals that um, don't eat any meat or don't have meat in their diet can still get iron from plants, um, similar to how a person who maybe is a vegetarian still has to get their iron by eating a lot of leafy greens. These are some really great questions and um, we are going to just do one more. So you can always email us if you have more questions. Um, but our last question for today is going to be, what is the difference between an amphibian and a reptile? Yeah, so amphibians and reptiles are two different groups of animals. So amphibians are like our salamanders and frogs. So they have those, they have skin instead of scales, whereas a reptile is gonna have scales. Um, but they do both rely on their environment to help um, keep their skin and their scales healthy and their bodies um, healthy. Um, they are, so like our, our reptiles are gonna be turtles and snakes. And then the amphibians are um, different salamanders and uh, frogs and toads. So they're two different groups of animals with different adaptations. All right, and that's all of our questions for today. Okay, so I, I know that our links are down at this other end. So I am gonna pick up the camera. So hold on to your seats. It might get a little shaky here for a second. And as I said before, it's a little bit warm here today. So the lynx is down here taking a cat nap. Oh, Laura, can you tell me if the lynx is on the camera? You can kind of see it towards the, the, towards the back of the enclosure, maybe about halfway back. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you can see him a little bit. Very, very sleepy right now. It's probably close to 75 degrees here in gray and they are still shedding out their winter coats. So on warm days to conserve their energy and keep nice and cool, they are gonna sleep for the whole day until food comes. Then they'll wake up long enough just to eat some food and then go back and take a nap. All right. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, I hope you had fun learning about different animal um, adaptations here in Maine. And if you wanna look at more virtual tours and different um, activities and resources to do at home, uh, we'll send out a email that has the links to our website, um, but it's mefishwildlife.com um, or you can go to mainewildlifepark.com to learn more about the park also. So thank you all and I hope you have a great day. Thank you everybody for joining us for amazing animal adaptations. To learn more, please visit us at mefishwildlife.com or mainwildlifepark.com.